Hi, this is Dan Sullivan, and great pleasure to be back here with my podcast partner on Free Zone Frontier, Steve Krein, who's in his office in Manhattan. Hi, Dan. I'm in Toronto. And Lee Richter is in Beverly Hills, California. So for the previous two podcasts, we've been going through what I call the Free Zone 5, which are five checkpoints, which if you actually become knowledgeable and you become very, very skilled, you have the right attitudes and you have the right habits, you will emerge and spend the rest of your entrepreneurial career in what we call a free zone frontier. And the free zone frontier is, first of all, the free zone is that you will have no competition. It'll all be collaboration. And frontier is that you'll be innovating new things in new marketplaces that uh, no one except those of you involved actually know you're doing it. Last two times, we went through number one, total cash confidence, number two, 25-year hero target, number three, deep dive innovation, and that was the kicking off point for understanding who you could collaborate with right now in the marketplace who's totally committed to the same 25-year hero target as you are, and they have total cash confidence to be a great collaborator. Now the question is, if you have another collaborator, do you have the right collaborator? Because it requires that one of you be a simplifier and the other one be a multiplier. So this is a new concept in Coach. It's been there for probably a half a year. Lee, and then also Steve, what was your first response when I put this out as one world or another world, it was almost like binary. Right. You want to be 100% one or you want to be 100% the other, but you don't want to be half and half. Well, when you first brought it to us in the meeting, I think there were about 30 to 33 of us in the room. And I naturally assumed since we were in that room and very successful that we were all multipliers. So initially I thought, oh, we're all alike. Yeah, we're so much the same. We're all doers. We're getting things done. And what I found out is in our room, it's more like 75 or 80% are simplifiers and about 20 to 25% of us are multipliers. And there's a few of us that can go either way and we can simplify and multiply, but one of them is definitely our strength. And it was such a great way for me to learn more about our group, but also to then take it back into my industry and start looking around and just seeing how few multipliers really are out there. Yeah. I've done it on the entire, obviously, the Free Zone Frontier participants, but also the entire 10 Times Ambition program. And also, I've done it with about 10 other coaches in their classes or associate coaches. And it works out, it's for the quarter, and you know, this is kind of in the moment research, but I would say it's about 55, 45 for simplifier. There's about 45% are multipliers. And I have groups, you know, where there's more multipliers than simplifiers and some other workshop groups where, you know, the simplifiers dominate. But Steve, just your first response, because I (laughs) I remember us having a significant deep conversation on this topic. Pinball. I mean, I felt like it was like a multiplier, simplifier, multiplier, simplifier, and literally... That's the image I have in my head of like, wait, that, 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 and it was like going back and forth and back and forth. And the kind of, I want to call it peeling back the onion a little bit on the topic, started to think about really, are you naturally a simplifier or are you naturally a multiplier and how easy it is to justify simplification activities or multiplication activities in the wrong category, if you will. So, you know, it's funny because you said on the previous episode about, I think you were saying you and I are Mm -hmm. simplifiers. Mm -hmm. I've gone back and forth on whether I'm a simplifier or multiplier. And I've been very, very conscious during the different activities I do of what I'm gravitating to on this. And I think that I am, even in our business and what we're working on doing over the next couple of decades, And think about how it's a multiplication effort, right? It's about the idea Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. this is not about a bunch of individuals. It's about the collective power of an army of entrepreneurs working together, collaborating to achieve health moonshots. And so I do wonder, even I think about, you know, what we do across our flywheel, right? We invest in entrepreneurs and then we unite them into a global army and we broadcast their progress and we connect them into great stakeholders and we collaborate. 
and help facilitate collaboration among them. And I think about those activities, I'm like, which among them are simplification and which among them are multiplication? So mm-hmm. as an organization, which activities are we doing, which are each? But for myself, I have pinballed back and forth a little bit on that, mm-hmm. honestly. Yeah. First, I think saying I was a simplifier, you convincing me, I think I was a multiplier. Mm-hmm. Then I'm saying, yes, I am. But then I went back. And so it's been a back and forth. Probably because we were both willing, we've had tremendous amount of conversations over a long period of time. And I would say that the reason why you have 320 and it'll get a lot greater in the future, the number of health start entrepreneurial companies, you know, with 600 entrepreneurs is because you have established incredibly simple models for them all to follow. And there's no way that you could even attract or put together or hold together a network of 320 entrepreneurial companies if you hadn't had a passion that this has got to be very, very simple. And the same thing on the other side of your business of getting big institutions in many, many different fields to actually invest, to actually create the funding that allows these individuals to actually grow and allows you to actually create a huge, what I call a global entrepreneurial R&D lab. I think it's because of your simplification And I think that you react far, far more powerfully if something starts getting complicated than you do if you attempted to get the word out and it didn't get out the way you wanted to. In other words, you didn't get it out. I've just watched emotionally that you get more upset with any compromise of simplification than you do a failure to multiply the way you wanted to. So in that regard, I'm a simplifier. Yeah. And I think the rub here right, is around who you're collaborating with, yeah. either internally or externally, yeah. right? So I think therein lies an interesting dialogue around almost assessing an inventory of people where you've had the best collaborations and which role are you playing? And by the way, are you trying to play the wrong role? And also, are you playing with people who are equally clear on their role? Yeah. Well, it's kind of interesting because I'm just putting together the next 10 times workshop and it's actually on Simplifier Multiplier because that's the book of the quarter. So I came up with 10 questions, but one of them, you know, if you have these two activities, which one in the future would you retire from so that you could do the other one full time? So that's one question. But the question that really, really hit home You're in a room with two people. One of them's 100% simplifier, one of them's 100% multiplier. Which one bugs you the most? (laughs) And it's the one who's not needed because you're already doing that. Mm, Got it. That's a good way to flush it out. Lee, another multiplier in the room with you is completely redundant. No, because multipliers love working with other multipliers because that takes a 10x to 100x to infinity. No, they're still redundant because you can do it better than they can. Yeah, it's really interesting, but it gets out of hand very quickly because there's no simplification going on. You know, there's no simplification going on. There has to be part so, of it, yes. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So, Dan, in your 10-point checklist or however many you're on that list, yeah. I'd love you to go through them a little bit because I think... Well, I don't have it right in front of me, and it's okay. new. So then, theoretically, what are some activities that, if you were just to list two or three activities of each, that would help people really understand which activities they're drawn to that are more aligned with where you know which they are? Well, the difference is really in the first impulse and the first activity. So in any situation, my first impulse and my first activity is to say, this is too complicated. We got to get this simpler. Okay. I walk into any situation and a lot of talking is going on. And I sit there, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're all over the field here. This is the center. This is the center where we start. And that's my first impulse. And I'll defend it fiercely. I'll just defend any attempt to complexify (laughs) the first thing. But if I'm a multiplier, I'm not trying to simplify anything. I'm just trying to find an existing simplifier that nobody else knows about that I can take out and spread to the world. That's what I would say. 
is it's the first impulse. What do I do first in any situation? My first impulse in any situation is to say, this is way too complicated and I've got to get this really simple for anything useful to actually happen. Well, I'll send you the yeah. layout. And your first impulse, if you're a multiplier, is? Who needs to know about this? I can't wait to tell everyone. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I got to tell everybody about this. I got to get it out. Oh, I can. Who get... do I call first? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think you're right about the impulse because you do want other multipliers. Yeah. Oh. But simplifiers do not want other simplifiers. Multipliers want other multipliers. I think yeah. about like. I love working with Joe Polish because we think alike and yeah. we take it in different directions and still get it done. Yes. So I'm learning. You see, the reason why I don't know what multipliers do with each other is because I'm not one of them. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> see, right. What do they do when they get together? Yeah. What the? Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean. <laughs> so basically, if I am going to make this even more simple, it basically is if you don't want to constantly make it simpler and don't think things are still too complicated, you're not a simplifier. That's like, right. In other words, it wouldn't you bother made you. it really easy to say, if you don't feel this way on first impulse, then you're a multiplier. Yeah, it wouldn't bother you. You say, well, why would I even want to think about that? Let's just go find something that's simple that already exists, and all I need to do is get it out to the maximum number of people. Now, Steve, the ping pong or the, the that you were talking about originally, it's by force of necessity of becoming a successful entrepreneur that we have to do both. Right. Yeah. Okay. And you have growth plans that you personally, as the owner of a entrepreneurial enterprise, are responsible for seeing that they happen. And they're both simplifiers and they're both multipliers. So your responsibility to yourself and to your team and to your investors and to your customers and clients, you got to see that both of these happen as part of your value creation expansion. Yeah. What's interesting is, and I'm wondering, Lee, if you feel the same way I do on the multiplier side. And when I go to get on the flight to go to Chicago for my quarterly workshops, there's a calmness about the answers are coming. <laughs> on how to simplify all of the complexity that's going on in my head. I'm riffing a little bit on this first impulse thing, Dan, which is over the subsequent two days I'm in Chicago at Coach and throughout my own thinking or the conversations I'm having, I am seeking out constantly ways to simplify whatever it is I'm struggling with thinking about or working on. So it's an interesting way of just thinking about how I approach Coach. I'm wondering, does a multiplier... Uh, approach the series of workshops thinking about what it is they're looking to achieve and is it about helping them simplify or is it they're constantly looking at i'm going to go get that multiplier in there because i look for the simplifying framework in what you're sharing well let's check it out with lee because it's very relevant for the last meeting because i went with the intention of hooking up and connecting with dean jackson <laughs> because i wanted to multiply something that i'm working on and as soon as I walked in and found out he wasn't going to be there, I texted him. I'm like, how could you not be here? You were top of my agenda. And here he is, a natural multiplier. And I, as a multiplier, was bringing something to him that we could then work on together. So we have simplifiers already on the team working on it. It's just I wanted to collaborate with another multiplier. Mm. So I am looking at it differently than you are. Yes. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. It's interesting, Dean Jackson, that you bring up, by the way, because – he has this nine word email formula that he's talked about for years. That was one of those, like, I was like, oh my God, finally a simple way of following up on an email to get a response, right? But what's right. interesting is that he was doing it for multiplication purposes, right? In that regard. Yeah. I channeled him yesterday because my team sent me a draft of an email going out to the entrepreneurs, you know, for a follow up deadline coming up. And it was like three or four paragraphs. And I'm like, ah, what is this nonsense? Just strike it all out and ask the question. You notice they haven't responded. You know, are they interested in signing up? Nine words. Actually, it was like maybe 11 words. And the response rate, like Dean always says, was through the roof because we just asked a simple question. But I latched on to that suggestion of his because it was simpler. Yeah. Simplifiers really appreciate other people's simplifiers. Okay. But generally speaking, you know, and here's the thing is that a simplifier lives an alone existence at the beginning of the process. A multiplier is immediately looking for a company. Right. We have company from the beginning. But I do want to point yeah. out in that example that you just used, 
Dean Jackson, you're right, is using it to multiply and he multiplied for you in that you got more responses. So yeah, yeah, we're thinking about multiplication and what's the best way to reach our audience to get that action. Yeah. So sometimes we have to simplify to get more action. Yeah. Yeah. The interesting thing is that multipliers and simplifiers never tread on each other's territory. They just have no desire to do what the other person does. So what I notice is that the vast majority of entrepreneurs who feel that they're in a competitive marketplace try to give equal attention to the 50% that they're a simplifier and 50% that they're a multiplier. But what that does, it means that they can never ever attract, well, first of all, they never actually identify who they can actually be in the future. And in doing so, they'll never attract the opposite genius at multiplication. So what I've done, I think, and the collaborations are really speeding up the collaborations that are coming in my life, is that I've simply declared myself a 100% simplifier. So I want no activity that involves me in multiplying, except if it's set up like podcasts are a multiplier for me, quarterly books are a multiplier. But I do the minimum of work in these things. And I rely on other people's talents to kind of multiply me. And the thing is that more and more very, very high level multipliers are coming into my life. Okay. And the reason is they know there's no competition. I'm not going to try to compete with them as a multiplier, you know. Yeah. Is Babs a multiplier or simplifier? Pure multiplier. Pure multiplier. Okay. So yeah. you said we're both visionaries. You said you're yeah. both visionaries, but you have different visionary focuses. Do you think it relates to multiplier simplifier? No, it relates to program and company. I'm the visionary for the program. She's the visionary for the company. I mean, her total focus, where can the company go with us? Who do we have to connect with? And mine is, gee, I wonder, is the free zone five good enough? Maybe we have to simplify it here. <laughs> right. You know? So it is tied to the company is a multiplier. Right. Yeah, the company is a multiplier. And that's why entrepreneurs get their feet in both areas is because you have to be mm -hmm. before you can really have a lot of skill around you. You have to do both roles. That's one thing I talked about with Nick Nanton at the last meeting where he said he is a simplifier for himself, but his company is a multiplier. Oh, yeah. So yeah. Yeah. And it was a great, great breakthrough for Nick because he always thought, well, I'm the multiplier here. You aren't the multiplier. The technology that you employ and then all the networks you can plug it into is a multiplier. But Nick, you're the guy who just gets the essence of a person's message and you work on it and work on it. Let's just get down. I said no multiplier in the world would ever do that. Yeah. He simplifies the multiplication. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. by asking the right questions in the interview and taking it down to the most simple form is his genius. Yeah. That's exactly. And which are the stories? If I pick three stories that are just going to get the total message out, what are the three stories? The messages are the multiplier, but his identifying the messages is the simplification. Yeah. Yeah. It was a big moment for him to realize like his company is separate than him. Yeah. And it was good for him. Yeah. And it's true for me too. I mean, you know, more and more, I've got a specific unique ability role in a quite large company, you know, and you only bring Dan in here for these particular purposes, you know, and feed him red meat, hose him down once a week and don't let him get confused. You know, this is his role, <laughs> you know, and everything. And the more I just feel I can go on forever in this role. I mean, the people say, do you ever get tired of this? I said, not if I can just do these things. I never get tired. Is this where the who, not how kind of exercise even kind of plays more into internal and external collaborations? Yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, in your company, you want to see who the other multipliers are inside your company. It's the fastest, most non-negotiated teamwork in the world when a simplifier comes into contact with a multiplier. And the reason is neither of them want anything to do with what the other person's good at, except to utilize it to the maximum degree. That's the only thing you actually want to do. Yep. It's like my one podcast series where, you know, it's been, I would say, harder than any of my other podcast series, 
aside from your see Steve we had to get a third person on, on, on because we would keep going over and over and over and say do we have this clear yet because both of us has an instinct you know to do it I don't think the process is clear enough yet and the other person I experienced that with is Peter Diamandis because Peter is a simplifier you know, he takes all this technology and he simplifies it down into yeah. different ways of thinking about it. You know, over the years, just filling the butts, you know, just getting butts in the seat every year. I mean, Mike Koenig would fill up a workshop like that in a month. That would be easy. You know, 360 people, that'd be nothing. We'd have them in a month, you know. The whole point is that it takes a bit of self-reflection here. You have to actually look. But one of the things I said you're doing one of the activities and you do it 10 times in a row, full days, 10 days in a row. Which one, at the end of the 10 days, you're on a high? Mm -hmm. The other one is you're worn out after the third day. You're just dead tired. I can't do this tomorrow. Yeah. Well, the simplify to multiply, which is how I've been thinking about it. That's the correct entrepreneurial position on it. Simplify to multiply. Yeah. 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 Have you noticed in your assessment of who does what or who falls into what, does any of it tie back to Colby and the Colby score of quick start fact finding implementer? Well, it's a great question. And Babs and I have almost identical Colby scores. Okay. So I'm a 2204 and she's a 3392. But she has no instinct towards, no impulse towards simplifying anything. <laughs> I have to tell you, if I hadn't met Babs, I'm just alone in a rented apartment. I'm worried about the rent. <laughs> and I'm noticing that all those empty wine bottles weren't as satisfying as they should be. And I'm working on version 50 of a strategy circle. <laughs> uh, yeah. People say, well, you're really downplaying yourself. I said, I'm only good in the right conditions. I have to tell you, I'm very, very clear that I'm only right in the right relationships and the right conditions i'm i'm useless if i'm not positioned in the right place yeah the part of that i think that a lot of entrepreneurs can relate to is the last one around version 50 of something you know it's an interesting question of whether that's related to being a simplifier but so often not happy with what you just finished and know that there's another tweak to make in fact you had a difference between the name of the 360 dos versus deep DOS innovation. And that'd be like, in somebody else's world, somebody would be like, you did that, Dan, That it's gone to print, it's done, that's what you've been calling it. Why touch it? And for <laughs> you, it was, it's even simpler to explain it as deep DOS innovation than calling it 360 DOS. Well, it'd be like a canker sore if I recognized <laughs> it. I mean, I wouldn't sleep at night until that change was made. But I have adapted some things like 80% is good enough. I mean, there's some corrective mindsets I have, you know, that I don't think it's 100%, but another person seeing it will say it's 100%. But the whole point is that since we're going through the first three steps of the free zone five, let's get some explosive growth out of this. Let's get some explosive payoff out of this. Okay, and let's just find another person who's missing you. In other words, they could really go someplace, but they don't have something to really differentiate themselves in the marketplace, and you have the simplifier. And if you put the two things together, you'll actually create something entirely new and it'll be unique in the marketplace. And I think if you looked at partnerships in the high-tech world and in the industrial world, where there were two individuals, Sears and Roebuck, Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs and, you know, all the things, you'll find that one of them was the simplifier and the other one was the multiplier. That's why they really took off like a rocket, because they didn't walk on each other's territory. There was no internal fighting. They weren't battling. I think that's really important. And then the one thing is you have to start with one of each. And Steve, you can look at that. Who's been the main partners that you've had since you started Startup Health? And they'll identify themselves in terms of internal and external. My feeling is that you have to have one of each to get something started because there's no immediate multiplier payoff for having a person like yourself working on the same thing. It doesn't multiply itself. 
Yeah, you mentioned about business, but I think it applies in the personal life, oh, in your personal yeah. life even as much, if not more. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, does Rebecca kvetch over the things that you do? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know what? Perfect example of simplification and multiplication. Yeah. I yeah. think the underlying premise of who you are is evident in both personal and professional lives, whether you like it or not. So simplifiers are simplifier. They don't change when they walk in the door at night or go to work every day. Yeah. In the last one, the free zone collaboration, once you've started this collaboration and you're out there and competition has disappeared, you're creating value within deep DOS innovation, then all sorts of other multipliers and simplifiers are attracted to your movement. You can bring other simplifiers in, you can bring other multipliers, but they'll be doing something unique that's required for your growth. Chip Mock, I think, has been the greatest example with his collaboration of creating cure distribution systems. So instead of a disease management system, he's creating a cure distribution system right across North America. And I think it's kind of surprised him, actually. But it's very interesting because Chip is a simplifier. So he got to about 30 practices that he had bought of other plastic surgery practices. And he said, okay, it's getting too complicated. Now we've got to take a quarter out and really simplify things back. For We've outgrown our original simplifier model, and now we've got to, well, no multiplier in the world ever stops the multiplication. It's true. You're right. What's the problem here? Yeah. What's the problem here? You know, there's no problem here. But for a simplifier, there's a big problem. It's getting out of control. And um, when I'm looking at the stuff that Gary and I are doing, Gary's naturally a simplifier. And the yeah. world probably wouldn't know about him if I wasn't out there helping him over two decades <laughs> with it. But I'm glad. I love sharing him with the world. It's part of my joy. But then when I look with Steve and Startup Health, I'm looking at it as that's a way for us to be multiplying together. Yeah. So it's funny that I'm looking, hey, wait a second. We have this great message. We have momentum. We have authority. We have so much behind us. How do we then take it to a camp where there's other people to collaborate that then it is my multiplier? Yeah. 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 In that example, my framework becomes a multiplier oh, for yeah. what she's doing. And I also, you know, it's funny because, you know, the saying about a hammer looking for a nail. Yeah. And you always say your eyes only see and your ears only hear what you're looking for. And I think that that focus of not only the 25 year hero target, not only the deep DOS innovation, but the notion of that kind of black and white clarity allows you to constantly, like when she utters the word animal health, and I have a framework like a health moonshot. And I asked Gary this at the festival, how many entrepreneurs are out there really working on animal health innovation in the same way there is in human health innovation? And we started to talk about, you know, applying the same exact model and doing a 12th moonshot on animal health. Mm -hmm. And not only for the benefit of animals, by the way, but I think we had a chat, I forget on which of these episodes, or maybe it was the other call the other day around how much benefit there is in the translation from things we do with animals to things we will do or should do with humans. Oh, yeah. The love element aside, how many other things can we learn from how we're applying things with a lot less regulation and a lot less restriction mm. in animals and make it help and impact people? Well, one of the things is that the regulatory control of human health is way, way beyond the regulatory control of animal health. You know? Sure. Yeah. In a lot of ways, that's true, yes. Part of it is the simplicity of the pay-as-you-go model. You know, if it doesn't work, you don't call your congressman, you sue the guy. You know, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, it's straightforward. It's civil law. It's not regulatory. A civil law is one tenth of the complexity of regulatory law because it's easy. You know who the problem was. So anyway, this is kind of my run through. And first of all, I've learned loads from the conversation that we've had just going through the free zone five, and then the fifth one, of course, is this exploding free zone marketplace that you have. And I have to tell you, you'll never want to die once you get into that free zone because it's just so exciting. I've really noticed just as a sidelight of people getting in better shape as they get in the free zone frontier because you don't want to cut it short once you get on this route. So I'm very, very excited. And it makes me enormously satisfied of the 
46 years that I've put into coaching to get to the point where I am now with the level of individuals that I'm able to collaborate with and actually collaborate in the program and then collaborate ourselves, coach, having really great collaborations. But these three podcasts have been enormously satisfying to me. It's been a wonderful experience for me being in Free Zone with you, learning with you, but also looking at business opportunities differently because of the frameworks that we have right now. Yeah. It's been really wonderful. Yeah. I love yeah. it. Biggest insight from this conversation, this last episode, Lee? My biggest insight is we really have to do this because this can make a huge difference to so many people. And not only is it for the USA, it's really for the entire planet. And so my mind is just expanding every day with it. So I got an idea for both of you for your next festival, Steve. So it's a year off that you work with Lee and I'll help out there because... I'm a simplifier, but five things that people in the healthcare startup world dealing with human beings, five things that you could learn from the way that veterinarians work with their clients and work with their animal patients that would enormously expand the emotional, psychological power of anything that you're doing in the human healthcare field. So five crossover concepts from the veterinarian world that would enormously benefit the thinking that goes into creating a healthcare moonshot. I think that's great context for the framing of a moonshot dedicated to animal health. I think the two parts that I hadn't seen into the last couple of conversations, even a couple of days ago when we were all on the phone, was this notion of not just the clinical benefits that can come from things and breakthroughs in animal health and science, but actually the love and emotional part, mm -hmm. which I think is almost a, you got to really step back and get out of the weeds to really think about just that, who we are and why we're here and how much different everyone approaches walking into the vet and how the vet even treats the experience differently or is able to treat the patient differently than a human doctor is. Yeah, and I think that in your messaging, Steve, going out and you're looking at this aspect, just so contextually differentiates you for as long as you wanna do this, that nobody would even understand it enough to even articulate it. And Lee, I would say the same thing for you, that you can completely recontextualize your approach to the entire pet health care by saying things we're doing here are pioneering entirely new concepts, new strategies, new methods in the human health care because we're using our devotion to animals as a framework for understanding what our devotion has to be to human beings if we're going to have a real health care system on the planet. Brilliant. I love it. All right. All right. Excellent. Great sessions, guys. Lee, Always wonderful spending time with you. And Dan, same. Enjoying the podcast evolution as well with these conversations. See you in Boulder. Yes. Take care. Okay. You guys in Arizona. Okay, bye.